Robots Radio presents. In 2004, director Michel Gondry and star Jim Carrey explored the mystery of memories. In 2020, we returned to Tennessee for a top shelf offering. The film is the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. The whiskey is Jack Daniel's single barrel barrel proof select. And we'll review them both. This is the, the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm going to need to get into the whiskey right now <laughs> if I'm going to get through this episode. Oh, dang. Oh, dang. What's your name, sir? I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 2004 film Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. The quote goes, how happy is the blameless vessel's lot? The world forgetting by the world forgot." Eternal sunshine of a spotless mind. Each prayer accepted, and each wish resigned. I want to be a great, big, oh, huge so elephant. With a huge trunk like that. Clementine. Uh, yeah. yeah. I haven't heard that one. It's lovely. I just thought it would be appropriate, maybe. Brad, it sounds like I can already tell that you did not like this movie. And before you even answer me, I want to give a little background about our podcast. Maybe this is the first time you've ever tuned in to the Film and Whiskey podcast. The whole conceit of this podcast is that I grew up watching tons and tons of movies. I'm a huge movie nerd. My friend Brad has watched a lot of movies in his day, but he hasn't seen most of the movies that we're going to watch on this podcast because I created a list of films that I think Every film lover should watch, whether they're good or they end up being something that you don't like. And so we're kind of putting Brad through the ringer as we watch all of these movies. And one of the films that I purposely put on this list was 2004's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Brad, initial reactions. F well, you did not like this well, movie? First off, I want to say that you make it sound like I'm an uncultured swine. And I just want to no, I, I just want to remind Film and Whiskey Nation that I gave The Tree of Life a nine and a half out of ten. So it's it's funny you say that, Brad, because this movie that we're reviewing today is actually one of I'd say like five movies on the whole list that I have been most excited to hear what you think about. Not that I thought you were going to like it necessarily. But when we did The Tree of Life, it was like our eighth episode ever, I think. And I was like, Brad is going to hate this movie with a burning passion. And over the course of that episode, we really hashed out some of like the, the deeper themes of that movie. And you kind of came to a place where you were like, OK, I, I am OK with this like really artsy cinema. And ever since that movie, I've never really been able to predict what you're going to think of some of the films on this list. And so Eternal Sunshine is one of these ones that I was like, it's out there. It's surreal. It's funny at parts. It's really sad and depressing and a downer at parts. Brad might love this movie or he might really, really hate this movie. So I I'm excited to, to talk about it today, Brad. Bob, I have two things to say to all that. First off, I'm glad there's still some mystery in our relationship. <laughs> I agree. Second off, I think my biggest frustration with this movie, and this is honestly like my biggest indictment, is that it's just boring. It's not an entertaining film in any way. It doesn't cause me to think more deeply about the world around me. It's just kind of a boring movie that doesn't really take me anywhere. And I get to the final scene in the movie, and in my head I'm just thinking to myself, man, if they just had open conversations during their relationship – they would have been able to avoid all this crap. Yes, that's uh, the... Oh, uh, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to get into it because I think you're missing the point of the movie already. But before we get there, we got to go to one of our standard segments, our favorite segment, which is called Brad Explains. And this is where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he's just watched, sometimes for the first time. Brad, I'm going to ask you to refrain as much as possible from giving us a snarky Brad Explains. But please... Walk us through the plot of this movie as best as you can. The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is a movie about two people, 
played by Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet, who have had a, I would say, a few years long relationship. Um, They don't really give an exact timeline, but it seems like they've dated for a few years. And they have a bad breakup. And after this breakup, Kate Winslet, who's a bit of an impulsive, you know, decision maker, decides to erase her memory completely of Jim Carrey. And in doing this, Jim Carrey runs into her, realizes that she has no memory of him with the help of some friends, and he decides to also erase his entire memory of her. But in the process of having his memory erased, he realizes that he doesn't want to forget her. And so he tries to hide her in the recesses of his mind, in old, old memories of him as a child or a teenager. And through this process, he begins to know her more. He gets to know her better. And by the end of it, he is able to implant a bit of her in his brain so that he can reconnect with her in the real world. They reconnect, realize that there's a need for open communication, and seemingly at the end of the movie, they resume their relationship. That was a really good summary of the movie, Brad. Thank you for breaking that down like that. Thanks, man. I just I just want you to know that I actually do watch these movies. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> So this movie comes out in 2004. It's released by Focus Features. If you if that sounds familiar to you, it's because, well, A, they're a major producer of indie films, but also because just a few weeks ago, we talked about Lost in Translation, which was also a movie that was released by Focus Features just a year before. And I do see like a lot of similarities in what you're talking about, Brad, and how this movie... It definitely takes its time. Like it's, it's, it has a rhythm of its own. It's definitely like there's some parts where it's cut really quickly. There are other parts where it's kind of jumping around in time and you're not sure what's going on, but it's, it's unconcerned with the rhythms, I think. And I couldn't help but think about some of the comparisons to Lost in Translation because that was a really apparently very popular indie movie from the early 2000s. And I think this one is even more so. I think. And my experience might just be unique or like an anecdote or whatever. But I think if you asked around to people our age, this is one of those movies that it wasn't a huge success at the box office. But like everyone I know of a certain age has seen this movie, it seems like. And it seems to have really resonated with people in our age group, Brad. I don't know. Were you familiar with this movie before you watched it this time around? Yeah, I had heard of the movie. You know, it's been on Netflix for a little while. I, I don't think it's on there anymore. But it, it's one of those movies that I saw previews of and I was like, oh, that looks kind of interesting. Like the idea of erasing somebody completely from your memory. That is an intriguing premise. So, yeah, sure. I had heard of it. I knew the premise and I was intrigued by it. But then I watched it and I realized that it's just not a good movie. All right, so we're going to get into that in a second. But I want my first point against you to be this, Brad. I'm really surprised that you were bored by the movie. I think, if if anything, I was expecting you to say, like, I was confused by the way it jumped around in time, or I didn't like the sort of surrealistic elements to it. This movie was written by a guy named Charlie Kaufman, who has become a really famous writer in Hollywood. He only produces, you know, a, a script every few years. And they're always these really trippy mind-bending kind of movies. He first became really famous for his script for the movie Being John Malkovich back in 99, and then he did Adaptation, which won some Oscars, uh, and then he did this movie. And this is probably, I'd say to this day, his most famous and probably his most well-regarded script. And it really is a mind-bender of a movie. When you think about just like the plot of the film, you're inside of somebody's mind watching his memories play out. And All you get to know about his relationship with this girl, Clementine, is played through the memories that you're watching fall apart around them because the memories are being erased. And so sometimes the characters in the memories play out like people in a memory would. And then all of a sudden they'll kind of become autonomous and they'll realize, oh, this memory is disappearing. We have to run away. And it's just this really crazy, trippy, surreal movie for a good portion of the film. And so I'm kind of surprised. Brad, that you would say that you were bored with it. So, like, fill me in a little bit. Why? Why? What bored you about this film? I honestly like the tricks and you know things that they use to keep your attention had nothing to do with the plot in my mind. 
Like the plot of this movie is that two people weren't super well suited for one another and they didn't communicate well. And so they broke up with each other. Like that's normal life. That's okay. And I just watched this movie and throughout the entire thing, as they delve into his memory and you also see the, you know, the people who do the memory deleting, you see a little bit into their lives and what they're all about. I just wasn't interested. The start of the movie, you know, you see the two of them interacting and very quickly I realized, oh, that's like at the end of the movie, chronologically speaking, even though they showed it at the start. So like I realized right away that that they were messing with the timeline as far as what the audience was seeing. So I honestly for me the movie was just two people who don't communicate well and that's not very interesting to me. You know, oh, Jim Carrey's edgy because he has some mental issues. And, oh, Kate Winslet is edgy because she's super needy and impulsive and dyes her hair different colors. That, that That's not interesting to me. It, it doesn't al- have any allure for me. It doesn't draw me in. And so the whole movie was just watching them be kind of ridiculous. And it didn't feel like there was any sense of growth in the characters. Wow, I'm I'm really surprised that you say... Like, I feel like I can get on board with, like, some of what you say, and then, and then you say something else. Like, I'm really shocked that you say something like there wasn't any growth in the characters, because even though, like, you hit the nail on the head, the movie is about people that don't communicate with each other. And I think it's a commentary on how we all have terrible memories, and we all have things in our lives that we regret, and maybe that is something like a bad relationship, you know, uh, someone dying, someone leaving us. And I think what Charlie Kaufman's trying to say with the script is just, like, it's better for us to have the hurt. It's better for us to have the regret and it's better for us to have the memories uh, because that helps us grow and that helps us become better people. And I think you're absolutely right, Brad. At the end of the film, they get back together. And so the whole the whole point of the movie is like the memory erasure thing didn't work in general and you can't delete somebody from your life. And I actually think this movie is way more pertinent now than it was even 15 years ago when it came out because You know, now we have social media and now it's really easy to block somebody and literally delete them from existence on social media in your eyes with the tap of a finger. And I think this movie has a lot to say to 2020. Yeah, I hmm. honestly, I, I look at the way the movie ended and I go, I don't think these two people should be together. And and that's a big struggle for me. They they're not good for one another. And I go, oh well, you guys got back together. Great, good for you. But like, did you actually learn anything? Because in the end, the whole movie is in Jim Carrey's brain. You know, Clementine didn't learn any of the lessons that he really learned. And so I just feel like they are not a good couple and shouldn't be together. And sure, you you learn the lesson of like you can't just delete people from your life that there's still emotional scarring from who they are. But was it But was it worth it? But was it worth it? Yeah. So I'm really happy you say that, Brad, because I think for me, this is why this movie is brilliant, because I think there's two ways to interpret the ending. I think there's the really romantic way to interpret the ending. And that final scene you get between Joel and Clementine in the hallway, when she says stuff like, I'm going to let you down, I'm going to. I'm going to hurt your feelings. We're going to be right back here again. And he just shrugs his shoulders and says, "Okay, I'm not perfect. I can't see anything that I don't like about you. But you will. I can't. But you will. You know, you will think of things and I'll get bored with you and feel trapped because that's what happens with me. Okay. Okay. I think that's a really beautiful sentiment and that's what it kind of means to be in a relationship. Yeah, I'm I'm on board for that. I'm signing up for the fact that we're not going to be perfect and we are going to hurt each other. And I think when you read the movie through the really romantic lens, it's like, wow, Joel was able to overcome the erasure of his memory to find this person again. And, and you read the movie and it's like, wow, they're destined to be together. There's like this element of fate or destiny involved that they just happen to find each other again and decide to get together again. The other way to read the ending of the movie is like, okay, but maybe they really aren't supposed to be together. Maybe they really are bad for each other. 
And I think you get that in the fact that, like, like you said, Brad, you only see Clementine through Joel's point of view. And you also don't see Clementine like trying to hide Joel in her memory. The only person, as far as the movie tells us, that has ever fought back against the procedure happening is Joel. So maybe Joel just loves Clementine way more than than she loves him. And I think the very last shot of the movie echoes this because it's a shot of them kind of running through the snow. And the director, Michel Gondry, does this really brilliant thing where he plays that same thing three times again. And the suggestion is like, maybe they go through this again and again and again. And when you read it through that lens, it's like, oh, man, maybe this is really just a doomed relationship. But I think either way you read it, Brad, you still have to see it through the lens of like, it's better to have the hurt. It's better to have the memory than to think that you can just like delete it out of your life. See, and I I read it completely differently. To me, it feels like when at the end of the movie, when she says, I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to do these things. It feels like with the way the movie ends with the repetition, it feels like she's just going to do these things over and over and over again. And she's not taking responsibility for these things. I think it's okay for us as human beings to say, hey, you hurt me. I would prefer if you didn't do that again. Now, is there grace and love and understanding if they do hurt you again? Yes. But at some point you have to say, like, is this really worth it? Is it worth my emotional pain and scarring and suffering to continue to subject myself to this person hurting me over and over and over again? And the answer is no. At a certain point, if that person is not willing to change in any way, then no, they're not worth your time and you should leave them. To me, it just felt like she was saying, well, I'm going to be myself. I'm impulsive. C'est la vie. And that that just annoyed the heck out of me because I'm like, Joel, you deserve more than that. You deserve somebody who says, I understand that the way I've acted has hurt you and I'm sorry and I know that my actions have had consequences in your life and I'm going to try to change. I'm going to try to become better for you. And and I just don't feel like there's any sense of that in this movie. It feels like to me she's just saying, well, I guess I'm going to be who I am. So I've tried to think of like parallels for this movie, other movies that are kind of similar to it in a sense. And it's hard to do because I really think this is a very unique movie, both in the concept and in the way that it's executed on screen. I think the closest movie to this that that kind of gets at the same theme would be this movie called Her that came out a couple years ago with Joaquin Phoenix. It's a movie that I hope we get to someday on the podcast. But in terms of movies we've seen, I think there's two movies that we could kind of draw parallels to, and one would be Lost in Translation, which we already mentioned. It's these feelings of isolation and loneliness. It's got these kind of quirky indie movie vibes from the early 2000s. And then the other one would be 500 Days of Summer. I mean, I think just on an obvious level, it's it's a movie about kind of a doomed relationship. It's a movie where you're seeing everything from the guy's point of view, and so you get kind of really complicated emotions towards the female because is she being vilified? Are we actually seeing an accurate representation of her is everything skewed brad i want to hear what your thoughts are on how this movie kind of relates to 500 days of summer in your mind do you do you see similarities or is it really different to you honestly i i feel like those two movies are very different because with 500 days of summer you see joseph gordon levitt trying to move on and process what he's gone through whereas in this movie it feels like joel you know, played by Jim Carrey, just is continually trying to find ways to hold on to the good aspects of Clementine while forgetting the bad aspects. And so to me, it feels like a very different emotional movie where 500 Days of Summer is genuinely searching for closure and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind just feels like it's trying to ignore the problems and hold on to what is good. But all right, listen, we we need to take a break here soon. And I don't want to get a I don't want to like spark a real argument here. But Brad, I feel like you're actually picking up on a ton of what this movie is supposed to convey. And I guess my confusion is like you see it, but why does that make it a bad movie? Like I absolutely agree with everything you just said about how it's not really about closure, about how it is open-ended. And how, you know, maybe Joel does deserve better and he's making a bad choice. But, like, why can't we have a movie that depicts those things? Like, why does a movie have to have 
closure? Why does a movie have to have a happy ending? I, I, I think like I think what this movie does is really, really brilliant and it's done well. And I guess I'm still struggling with why you think that it, it's poorly made. I, I think it just feels gimmicky to me. The the whole mind memory erasure thing feels gimmicky because it's so far fetched from reality that the the whole f- movie is just kind of dumb. All right, all right. We need to drink some whiskey because <laughs> I'm feeling personally attacked at this point. So I I mean, go ahead. I mean, I I hate to say it, but it's a similar sense of how I felt about Gone with the Wind. You know, you were talking about movies that this reminds you of. Honestly, this movie kind of reminds me of Gone with the Wind. This melodramatic, way over the top, ridiculous telling of a story that's just unnecessary. I, I don't enjoy it in any way. Dude, you are like a hot take machine today. I need to just pull audio clips out of this episode and just infuriate fans of every movie everyone's ever loved, <laughs> except Star just, Wars. It's the only one you still like, apparently. I'm just being honest with you, Bob. This is how I feel about this movie. All right, man, let's take a break. Let's try this Jack Daniels single barrel select so that I can fuel myself to get through the rest of this episode. What do you say? <laughs> let's get to it. So today we are checking out Jack Daniels Single Barrel Barrel Proof Select. That is a absolute mouthful to say. It really is, Bob. I hope I got it right that time. Now, this was a sample that was sent to us by our friend Chris Blattner at Urban Bourbonist on Instagram. If you're a listener, longtime listener to the podcast, you will recognize that name. Chris has been sending us tons of samples to try, and we are just eternally grateful for how many samples he's been sending us. So first of all, Urban Bourbonist, thank you so much for the Jack Daniels. Yeah, Chris, we are so thankful for you. I absolutely love listening to your live broadcasts on Instagram. You're informative, you're fun, and we're just so thankful that you are a friend of the podcast. So when it comes to this Jack Daniels, Brad and I still haven't actually tried on air Jack Daniels, you know, standard black label Tennessee whiskey. Last season, we tried Gentleman Jack, which we both liked quite a bit. So this is the second that we're trying in the Jack Daniels line. Now, this is, as the name says, a single barrel. Now, I am pulling the information for this whiskey off of one of my favorite bourbon sites called Breaking Bourbon. They do bourbon reviews, and they are super informative. And this is what they have to say about single barrel select. After distillation, Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey undergoes what's referred to as the Lincoln County process. They allow their whiskey to drip for six days in 10-foot vats, passing through charcoal that was made by burning maple wood that had been impregnated with 140-proof Jack Daniels whiskey before being put into new charred oak barrels and aged for an estimated four to seven years. So they basically turbocharge their whiskey as it goes into the barrel. And then what we're getting here is somewhere between four and seven years in age. This comes out of one barrel. And Brad, I'm not going to sh- share what the proof is yet, because I want you to take a taste of this and tell me what you think the proof might be. But before we get there, let's take a sniff, a little smell here, and say what we think about the nose of this single barrel select. Well, honestly, Bob, I I feel like regular Jack is known for the burn that it has going down. And so it makes me nervous to think about a barrel proof version of such a whiskey. Me too, my friend. But uh, tell me about the nose on this. You know, I do feel like I'm getting those similar Jack Daniels notes. You know, there's some vanilla on here. It's oaky. It does remind me of normal Jack Daniels. Yeah, I mean, people like to split hairs about the difference between Tennessee whiskey and bourbon, and it really is just that charcoal filtering that makes the difference. This just smells like a phenomenal bourbon. I actually really love the nose on this, Brad. It has really, really dark bourbony notes. I'm not getting a lot of vanilla, but I am getting like a ton of brown sugar. Like it really just smells like someone is is 
caramelizing something with brown sugar and a bunch of maple syrup. It is like this really great, dark, sweet maple bomb and a little bit of like a banana. It's just super sweet. And I'm really excited to try it. Brad, I think I'm going to give this a nine out of 10 on the nose. Holy crap, Bob. That's a really high score. Yeah, I love the nose on this, man. Yeah, Yeah. I am worried because I'm getting a ton of ethanol on this nose. And it reminds me of other barrel proof whiskeys that just destroy your palate when you drink them. I, I'm honestly not noticing very many notes that you are. And so I, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10 on the nose. I'm nervous about this one. All right. Well, let's give it a taste and see if your nerves continue. <laughs> wow. My tongue is tingly. That's actually a really good word for what's going on when you take a sip of this. Yeah, I will say, beginner's tip for uh, drinking barrel-proof bourbon, give yourself a good deep breath before you take a sip. It kind of prepares you so that you don't need to breathe really quickly right after you take a sip, which can kind of mess up the process. So take a nice deep breath. Give it a second. Take a sip of that whiskey. Otherwise, it can go down the wrong pipe and ruin the rest of the drink for you. This one is interesting. I'm noticing those maple notes that you're talking about. Those came out pretty strongly. But outside of that, I I feel like I got a little bit of vanilla, but it's mostly tingly. This is a very high-proof whiskey. And Bob, I'm going to wager a guess that this is the highest-proof whiskey we've ever had on the podcast. So, Brad, as we're talking, I'm actually messaging with Urban Bourbonist on Instagram because I wanted to get some feedback from him on what it is we're drinking right now. Because when I looked on the Jack Daniels website, it said that the single barrel select was actually only 94 proof. And I drank this and this is like this is like beating me up from the inside. And I'm like, there is no way this is 94 proof. How is that possible? And he's confirming to me now this is, in fact, a barrel proof version of the single barrel select because I thought that I was just like way out there. And and Brad, you're actually really, really close to being correct. I'm not sure if it's the highest one we've ever had, but it's darn near close. This thing is clocking in at 129.6 proof. Holy crap. Yeah, this is... A heck of a whiskey as far as the alcohol proof. And I will say I'm impressed that the high proof is not destroying the flavor, but I won't give it the credit to say that it has tons of flavor. I'm really struggling to pick up different notes because my tongue is just getting destroyed by this, not in a negative way, but it's a bit of a struggle to get past that ethanol. Yeah, man, I'm not going to lie. I, I, it's destroying my tongue in a negative way. This is like, it's very spicy. Tingly is a really good word. And then you go to swallow it and it's like, it's hanging around and it's almost like it's forming like a block in my chest. It's just not going away. Uh, there's not a lot of actual taste on this. That's the thing that's really bothering me. After that really sweet, really great nose, it's sweet, but it's not distinctive. It just kind of tastes a little sugary and then... There's no subtlety to it. There's no flavor that lingers. It just burns a lot. I'm going to give it a five on the taste. I think I'll give it a six and a half on taste because I was so nervous about it up front. I actually think there's more taste here than I thought there would be. And honestly, to make a bottle of whiskey that has such a high alcohol content and still have flavor, I'm a little bit impressed. So I will give it a six and a half. But that doesn't mean it has tons of flavor. All right. So that takes us to finish. And I've already been saying like the, the finish on this, it it's not just a Kentucky hug. It's like a, a Kentucky vice grip. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like it's it's really, really hurting my chest. Uh, I am not a huge fan of the finish on this, Brad. But you're right. I mean, at such a high proof, it's like, what do you expect? I'm really happy to find out this is not 94 proof because I was I was thinking I was crazy. Uh, so at 130 proof. I guess I'll give it a five on the finish. You know what, Bob? I'm going to I'm gonna change my score. I, the more I take sips of this, the more I like the taste. The taste on its initial introduction to my palate 
is almost like honey. It, it it's warm. It's a mapley. I'm actually gonna up my score to a seven and a half on this for the taste. I I'm growing on this whiskey, and the finish isn't too terrible. It's definitely strong it, from an alcohol standpoint. But I think I'm still getting those notes of maple that you talked about. I'm still getting those notes of honey from the the opening taste. I'm actually a little bit impressed with this. I'm going to give it a seven and a half on the finish as well. Wow. Yeah, we're going to be very far off on this one today. Okay. Overall balance, nose, taste, and finish put together. I don't think this is very well balanced. I, I thought that the nose betrayed me a little bit. It wasn't as sweet as the nose suggested, and it actually ended up being much, much stronger than I thought the nose suggested. Brad, you picked up on that ethanol where I didn't. Uh, I'm going to give it a, I'll stick with a five again. I'm going to go with a five on overall balance. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna keep in the vein. It's a seven and a half on the balance for me. I, I think that it's well balanced. I noticed the ethanol up front and I wasn't disappointed. I was surprised by how much flavor they were able to pack in with such a strong alcoholic punch. All right. And that takes us to value. If you look online at some of the online retailers, they're obviously going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, I see it listed for $79.99 online. Uh, the cheapest one I see is $64.99. So Brad, let's just say that given wherever you might be in the United States, if we tried to kind of average out all the prices you might see, I think we should stick at like a $65 price point for this. It is single barrel. It is barrel proof. It is from the the most famous whiskey maker in the United States. I'm not surprised by the price on this. But man, if I didn't find this to be just aggressively harsh and not very pleasant, and I don't think I would ever pay $65 for this. So it's like, while I understand the price, I wouldn't buy it for myself. And so again, I think I'm just going to give it a five on value. So Bob, I'm actually going to give this a six and a half on on value. And if I had not ever drank the Elijah Craig barrel proof, then I might be giving this a higher score on value. But the Elijah Craig is a $60 bottle, and that is probably the best barrel proof I've ever had. And so with that being said, you know, $65 to $70 for the Jack Daniels, I think this is actually pretty good. And if I had somebody who was like, hey, Brad, I, I want to know more about barrel proof whiskeys. What should I try? I would suggest this to them. So $65 isn't terrible. It's a little bit overpriced, but I'll still give this a six and a half on value. All right. So that's bringing me out to a 29 out of 50. I I'm OK with that score. I don't really care for this. Uh, it's a it's just a little bit too harsh for me, but I, I think it's still fair. I don't think it's a poorly made whiskey. It's just the proof is is a little too high for me. Yeah, I, that's bringing me out to a 35 out of 50, Bob. I, I actually am pretty daggone impressed with this Jack Daniels. It's so much deeper than their traditional offering in its flavor and its profile. I, I'm really impressed right now. All right. So that brings us to an average of a 32 out of 50 or a 64 out of 100, which I think is a pretty fair score for this. Uh, Brad, I'm sure you'd probably like it to be a bit higher. I, I'm OK where it's at. I do want to say again, thank you so much, Urban Bourbonist, for sending us a sample of this. This is, you know, you're sending us whiskeys that we probably would never get the chance to try otherwise. So we are just so grateful to have this in our glasses tonight. Yeah, Chris, thank you so much, man. Like, it's so awesome that we have this amazing community of whiskey lovers out there. And we're just so thankful that that you have sent us this whiskey and that we get to share it with the world. So Film of Whiskey Nation... Give a shout out to Urban Bourbonist. Thank you for this whiskey. All right, Brad, what do you say we get back into talking about eternal sunshine of the spotless mind? I would prefer to keep talking about this whiskey, but <laughs> let's do it. All right, so that was Jack Daniels Single Barrel Barrel Proof Select. 
by far the longest name for a whiskey we've had on this podcast so far. I would agree with you. And Bob, I think you made a mistake pairing this whiskey with this movie because I think it's just going to fuel my frustration with this movie for our second half of the episode. I can't imagine what this must look like in someone's like Apple podcast player. It probably like breaks the number of characters you're allowed to have in an episode name. <laughs> All right. So, Brad, you don't like this movie. I like this movie a lot. Before we get final scores, because I think we've kind of already gotten into analysis. I've already said what I think this movie's about. I do think I want to hear or try to coax out of you a couple positives about this movie. So I want to talk about the performances really quickly, because I really think that Jim Carrey is absolutely phenomenal in this movie playing against type. I think that, you know, he could be sarcastic. He can be like really downtrodden and and timid. He's afraid in moments. He's angry. He's funny. I wish I'd stayed. I wish I'd stayed too. Now I wish I'd stayed. I wish I'd done a lot of things. I wish I had... I wish I'd stayed. I do. Well, I came back downstairs and you were gone. I walked out. I walked out the door. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I felt like a scared little kid. I was like, it was above my head. I don't know. You were scared? Yeah. And it's one of the best performances of, of that year. And I'm really anxious to hear what you thought about Jim Carrey in this film. Bob, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I really struggled with his performance. And I know that Jim Carrey is known for his overacting in a sense. You know, he just – he is so expressive and so crazy in his performances that you might look at a performance like this one and go, oh, wow, he's very deep. He's playing a different role. But honestly, the entire movie just felt like he had shut down everything that made him him. And you didn't get anything of who Jim Carrey really is as an actor. He felt like a shell of himself. And, and I didn't enjoy it as a performance. So I don't want to make too many comparisons again to like Lost in Translation. But I feel like he was kind of doing a similar thing to what Bill Murray was doing in terms of like downplaying his goofier, more outsized roles in terms of this really subtle, reflective kind of performance. And so I'm interested because I remember you really liking Bill Murray in that movie. And, and now I, to hear that you don't like Jim Carrey in this film is really surprising to me. Well, honestly, I think Bill Murray in, in Lost in Translation is not necessarily a different, you know, a completely different version of himself. The way he plays himself, he still has that dry humor that makes him him. You know, there, there's a sense that in Bill Murray's other movies, sure, he's goofy and a little bit crazy, but he's still he's still quiet in his other movies. He still has a very dry sense of humor that you get in this movie. I think the thing that would have helped make Jim Carrey's character more believable is if you got a sense of the positivity of his relationship with Clementine throughout the movie. You know, he just plays this this really depressed down person throughout the entire movie that I never get a sense of why he enjoys this relationship with Clementine. It really makes no sense to me. Wow. Here I am trying to draw positives out. So you don't like Jim Carrey. Uh, did you like Kate Winslet? Not really. Okay. <laughs> I will say the other person that I really noted in this movie who doesn't get a lot of credit was Kirsten Dunst. And I thought that she was really like, if this movie has an emotional core, it's her character of Mary. And, you know, about two thirds of the way through the movie, there's this really big dramatic twist where you, where you find out that she works for the doctor who is uh, performing all of these procedures. And you find out that at one time she had been having an affair with him and the doctor had erased her memories of that. And it's it's kind of this really like a gut punch of a reveal within the movie. And I thought that her character throughout the film, when she's in her sort of girlish flirtation and, and being attached to him all the way through to kind of having her heart ripped out at the end of the film, she just played all of those notes perfectly. It really is a, a sort of a tragic character. And I thought she was kind of like the unsung hero of this movie. Honestly, the the only scene of this movie that pulled at me emotionally was when she asked Mark Ruffalo, D did you know about this? And and he just says, look, no, like there was one moment where I kind of wondered when I saw the two of you talking and, and you seemed flirtatious. 
but outside of that one moment, I, I never saw you in that way, and so I kept pursuing you. So if anything, the the one emotional moment where I felt like I cared about any of the characters on screen was provided by Mark Ruffalo, actually, even though I think Kirsten Dunst was a, was a big part of it as well. All right, so Brad, I think we've talked about it long enough. I, I do want to hear your final score, and would you recommend this film? <sighs> I... Bob, there's not much to this movie that I liked. I, I think I just mentioned to you the only scene that I was really emotionally charged by. I'm going to give this movie a 2 out of 10. I, oh, my gosh, Brett. I, a, two, a 2. A 2 out of 10. I just didn't think it really had anything going for it. It was gimmicky. It didn't draw me in emotionally. I felt like the conflict was forced, that you could have just solved it with open communication. And I get that that's like the point of the movie, that we should communicate better with our other, you know, other half, our significant others. But nothing in the movie made sense. It it didn't make sense to me that she would go and get her memory erased of this person. And the, the explanation that they give in the movie is, oh, well, she's kind of flighty and impulsive, so I guess she would erase the memory of a relationship like that's just ridiculous to me and then the other part of it is they make the movie out to be so like set in the real world and then they offer up this really weird technology of oh you can erase memories and you do memory mapping and it, and it can blow out the emotional core and the memory fades and i just it just felt so gimmicky to me. And, and I guess as I say it, I realize that like when I say that the movie feels like it's set in real life, obviously the movie is very trippy in a sense. But like everything about the movie is realistic. The the cinematography, the the way they design the set. So it feels like they're trying to mimic real life, but then they introduce this brain-altering device that gets rid of your memories. It just feels dumb and gimmicky to me and and the whole movie feels forced i honestly bob it's not that i actively dislike this movie it's that i was just unimpressed with it all right so brad i i just i don't think i have time to argue with like every single point of what you said i think i am shocked that as a fan of sci-fi that you you couldn't get on board for a premise like this where it's it's li like light science fiction where it's like a slightly futuristic world or, or a world with a slightly different amount of technology. And I thought that they did a really good job of kind of incorporating it into the movie as like, yeah, it's just this thing that happens now. People get their memories erased. I don't know. I, I, I just I really think that this movie is genius. I think that the script is one of the most mind bending but brilliantly constructed scripts I've ever seen. Every time I watch it, I'm blown away by how this movie is put together. And I think it has a lot to say about what it means to be human. I think that, you know, these people aren't actually forgetting everything. You know, they keep finding things like Joel finds that painting in his, in his apartment that he forgot to throw away. And it, it keeps reminding them of who they used to be. And I think the movie's arguing that people need to be able to remember. It's part of what makes us who we are. I think it's a really inventive movie. Brad, I honestly think that if we put this to a, a poll like among our Instagram followers, I think you would, I honestly think you would be in the very small minority of people who dislike this movie. I see this movie coming up on lists of like the hundred greatest of all time. I don't think it would make my personal hundred greatest, but I think this is a nearly perfect movie. I'm going to give this movie a nine and a half out of 10. And so this, this makes our divide the biggest divide in the history of the film and whiskey podcast, bigger even than fight club. Yeah. And that, Yeah. I mean, that's fine. Like, you can like this movie, but I, I just, like I said, it's not even that it provoked deep passion in me as I was watching it. Like, it took me a while to kind of dredge up these feelings about the movie because it just felt boring to me. It, okay. it felt gimmicky. It didn't impress me in any way. And, and that's why I give it a two out of 10. I got to be honest. I think this one kind of hurts a little. I feel like you're getting a lot of it. And it's still not working for you. And that's that's what makes it hard, because I think for a lot of us who really love this movie, like it it just works for us. And I think maybe this is how you probably felt when I didn't like Fight Club a little. You know, it's like it's got to be hard to dislike a movie that much that is so kind of beloved by such a, a large group of people. And so, Brad, you're coming out to a two out of ten. I'm coming out to a nine and a half out of ten. 
that puts our average at a 5.75, which is just a score that I did not expect this movie to get. I have a feeling that we'll get a lot of feedback on this episode, and we would love to hear it. Yeah, Bob, I'm looking at this, and you're probably right. IMDb has this as an 8.3 out of 10. So I, I recognize I'm probably in the minority. So if you want to argue with Brad, argue with me, tell us what you think about this movie, please get on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Film Whiskey with an E. But if you want to give us a call and let us know how you feel about it, give us a call at 216-800-5923. Once again, the phone number is 216-800-5923. Next week, we will be back talking about a movie that I'm pretty darn sure we both like. 2012's Quentin Tarantino masterpiece, Django Unchained. For the Film and Whiskey Podcast, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.